story, which is the opening, which is the opening anecdote in the book. All right. So, in the heat of an August Roman August in 1524, an agent called Labatino wrote to his patron Federico II Gonzaga of Mantua with a bold pronouncement. When he returned home from Mantua, he said he would bring the prince the most precious thing one could have in the world. This marvelous item was not a rare gem, nor a precious metal, nor a weapon of war, but instead a medicinal oil that had been proven to work against poison. This antidote had been created by a surgeon and former friar named Gregorio Caravita, who had used it on plague patients in the hospital of San Giovanni Laterano to great success, or so it was perceived. When asked what else also might be good for, Caravita claimed that it would cure any poison taken into the body. These claims were quickly brought to Pope Clement VII, who decided to have the oil tested. He commanded his medical personnel to try it on two criminals who had been condemned to death. Led by the personal, Pope's personal physician, Paolo Giovio, the doctors gave both prisoners a good quantity of a deadly aconite called Napellus, enough to kill not merely two men, but 100, in Labatino's words. As the poison took effect, the prisoners started to gesticulate wildly and cry out from the pain in their hearts. Immediately, Caravita anointed one of them with some of the oil, and the man's heart and pulse quickly returned to normal. The other prisoner, who was given no antidote, died in great agony. A second test of the oil on a Mantuan criminal poisoned with arsenic yielded similar results. Labatino boasted that Jovio had promised him a sample of the antidote to bring back to Mantua. He also noted that Caravita knew how to make the oil and might be willing to pass it on for a price. So word of this event spread quickly. Less than two weeks later, a four-page pamphlet appeared in print, described as a testimony of the most true and admirable virtues of a composite oil against plague and all poison, of which on the command of the Supreme Pontiff Clement VII, an experiment was conducted by distinguished men in the Roman Capitoline edifice. So this was written in Latin and addressed to all good mortals, although of course only some mortals would be able to read Latin. Um, and it was signed by the three people sort of most involved in conducting the test. Um, the Roman Senator Pietro Borghese, who was in charge of executions, the physician Paolo Giovio, and also the papal um, pharmacist Tommaso Bigliotti. And Clement VII himself had ordered its publication. So from this pamphlet, we learned that the first test of Caravita's oil involved two Corsicans named Gianfrancesco and Ambrogio. The medics gave them marzipan cake poisoned with aconite, and there's a very long description of where they got the aconite from in the Apennine Mountains and how they made these marzipan cakes. Um, Caravita then anointed Gian Francesco with the antidote oil, while Ambrogio was given no antidote because he was the more savage of the two. So there's sort of a moralistic background to this. Ambrogio died, suffered for four hours before he died. And Gian Francesco, after his impressive survival, um, was sent to the slave galleys instead of being executed, which was intended as a reward, though possibly a somewhat dubious one. Um, the testers then wished to see if the antidote worked against other poisons, not just Napellus. So they obtained permission to conduct a test on a Mantuan man named Antonio, who was convicted of murder, um, who drank a swill of raw eggs mixed with sugar and arsenic. This time, Jovio, Bigliotti, and Borghese administered the poison and the antidote with their own hands to make sure that Caravita was not tricking them in some fashion. This second test, too, was successful, and like John Francesco, Antonio was sent off to the slave galleys. The pontiff then granted Caravita a substantial sum of money as a reward. So these two accounts put together leave little doubt that in early August 1524, Pope Clement VII and his personal physician devised a test using deadly poison on human beings to see if they could be cured. The event appears to have all the quintessential elements of the darker side of Renaissance Italy. Poison, violent prisoners, cruel popes, greedy princes, and Mantuan spies. We might be tempted to call it the case of the poison marzipan and relegate it to the files of historical oddities as some historians have already done. Yet the test of Caravita's oil had a significance that went 
far beyond Pope Clement's fear of poison and his power over those condemned to die. It provides very early evidence of contrived experiments conducted on human test subjects by respected medical professionals. Jovio, Biliotti, and Borghese not only signed the public pamphlet announcing the success, they also specifically claimed the report was true and presented it as a significant and valid medical finding. This test was also witnessed by an ambitious young physician, Pietro Andrea Mattioli, who ended up being one of the most central figures in my book, somewhat to my surprise. Mattioli was a student of Caravita's at the time. Two decades later, he included a description of this poison trial in his Commentaries on Dioscorides, which was one of the most influential medical books in the 16th century. It was originally published in Italian, but translated into various European languages, and I've listed them all here on this slide. Um, and Matthew like, constantly updated the book throughout his life. So there are a number of Italian editions and a number of Latin editions, a couple of different French editions. Um, so he was constantly adding information to it. But from the very first edition in his section on aconites, Mattioli used the trial of Caravita's oil as evidence of the herb's toxicity. Its appearance in the work of the respected Mattioli spread word of Clement VII's antidote test far and wide, especially after it was translated into Latin in 1554 and reinforced its medical legitimacy. By 1540, a few copycat trials had already sprung up in other parts of Italy, all testing derivatives of Caravita's oil and all involving a member of the clergy. So a couple of different cardinals um, tested it. So these are clearly um, tests that were derivative of Pope Clement VII's test that passed through networks of discussion among the um, upper echelons of the um, Italian clergy. After the publication of Mattioli's book, however, poison trials spread around Europe and other expanded to include other antidotes, not just these antidote oils. So between 1524 and 1600, over a dozen documented poison trials on condemned criminals took place in Italy, France, and the Holy Roman Empire, with allusions to many others. These tests on condemned criminals always took place at the command of a powerful prince, pope, or cardinal, and they were all conducted by prominent physicians or surgeons. So my book tells the story of these poison trials. Um, it focuses on these tests, both as a mirror of Renaissance medical practice and as an important crucible for ideas about evidence, authority, and proof. So for the rest of my time today, I want to do two things. First, I just want to present the main ideas and arguments of the book as a whole. And then I would like to delve a little deeper into two of the book's chapters. So in developing and carrying out these trials, physicians devoted um, careful attention to method and wrote detailed experimental reports. So my first argument is that antidote trials generated extensive engagement with experimental thinking. So it's significant that, that this produced such an amount of writing because they provide rare examples of contrived trials to test drugs, what we might now call an experiment. Um, and I'm using the phrase experimental thinking to sort of signify this kind of experiment before it was really called an experiment. The language around experiment in this time period was very vague. There are a number of different terms used to describe this kind of event that I'm looking at. I'm calling them poison trials. The word trial was used quite frequently um, to describe these, but also experiment, also exper experience. Um, there are a few others that are slipping my mind now, but the, the language is very imprecise to describe this kind of event. Um, and, but it's significant that this kind of event, a uh, contrived experience um, using poison took place because in general, it was viewed as very difficult and unreliable to test drugs through this kind of contrived experiment. The predominant medical theory was the idea of the four humors, um, as most of you have probably heard of, which meant that each person had an individual balance of humors that was normal for them. 
that meant that different drugs would act differently in different people. Um, so if you had a if red blood predominated in you, and so you're a sanguine temperament, um, you would use different drugs than someone who um, had black bile predominating and was a melancholic. Um, so it was really hard to test drugs. You just had to know their properties so you knew how to fit them into the system. Drugs are usually tested um, by observation on ill patients at this time period. Um, and it's a very descriptive system involving case studies for the most part. All right. But poison was an exception. It was seen as working a bit differently than other kinds of substances. Um, so this theories, theories of poison began to coalesce um, throughout the early Middle Ages, later Middle Ages, and early modern period. Um, a historian named Fred Gibbs has written a really um, helpful book describing how theories of poison changed over this time period. Um, but there was viewed that rather than working within the four humors um, or so some poisons did work within the four humors, but another entirely different explanation was developed in which the whole substance of the poison would affect the whole substance of the body. And this theory was called total substance or a specific form. Um, and it would especially affect the heart. Um, so the poison was seen as going particularly towards the heart, but it was basically something that completely circumvented the Galenic medical system. This explained why a very small amount of poison could affect the body so significantly, and also why poison affected people of completely different humoral complexions completely diff the same way. So how everything seemed um, universally applicable. It also meant, however, that poison and its antidotes were easier to test because it worked the same on everyone. So poison had long been viewed as particularly testable. The subject either lived or died. So pretty simple. Um, so testing of poison antidotes on condemned criminals um, was something mentioned in some ancient sources, quite a few ancient sources, most famously King Mithridates VI Eupator, of King of Pontos, um, was known for using both self-testing, self but also testing on condemned criminals to develop his famous poison antidote called Mithridatium. Um, so he's most famous for taking small quantities of poison every day to kind of build up you know, what he thought was immunity against them, but also testing antidotes um, uh, testing antidotes against it. Um, but he also, which is slightly less known, used condemned criminals for this purpose. Um, and in his commentaries on Dioscorides, Mattioli, this um, 16th century physician, specifically mentioned the um, tests that Mithridates had carried out on condemned criminals. So he's deliberately drawing on this ancient precedent, which in the Renaissance um, was quite fashionable to draw on the ancient authorities. In addition to um, Mithridates, the Greco-Roman physician Galen, on whom so much of uh, Western medicine was based at the time, also wrote about um, testing antidotes. Um, I should mention that that this text on Theriactopizo that I'm going to talk about briefly here was attributed to Galen. Uh, historians have gone back and forth about whether Galen actually wrote it. Um, the most recent evidence seems to suggest that it was probably a student of Galen's, but that doesn't really matter for our purposes because all of the people who I'm examining in the Renaissance um, thought that Galen wrote it. So they're assuming that this is a Galenic text. In any case, this, this text on Theriac to Piso um, noted that it was taboo to conduct tests on fatal tests on human beings or potentially fatal tests on human beings. So to show the efficacy of the drug Theriac, which became one of the most popular drugs um, into the 19th century, uh, Galen conducted tests on roosters and he divided them into a group that received the theriac and a group that did not. And he described how he put, he let, allowed the roosters to be bitten by poisonous beasts. Um, and then those who had theriac would survive and those who didn't have theriac would die. Um, so you find versions of this text in medical texts that were um, 
written in the Islamic empire. And then from the Islamic empire, they creep into Lat the Latin Middle Ages in Europe. So this idea of having um, tests on animals that use poison and particularly theriac um, as an antidote is something that is definitely a thread, a very small one, but a thread in the textual tradition that goes into the Middle Ages. And Mattioli noted, that, noted this text too. So he mentioned this text specifically in his book, um, how the ph physicians of ancient um, Rome made test trials of theriac. Um, Galen would have been horrified actually by this description because he specifically said that physicians did not use tests to devise the drug, that they used their intellect knowing what all the ingredients were and how they would fit together, that that's how they created it. But um, in sort of describing these tests, Mattioli is noticed making a much more empirical argument about it. In any case, the in the 16th century, physicians serving at princely courts reintroduced the use of condemned criminals for testing antidotes. But they added a new twist. Many of them wrote very detailed reports about these tests. Um, so it's not just a short mention like we had previously, they're very long explanations. And so I argue that 16th century physicians use the idea of poison as particularly testable, which was a long historical trend to conduct contrived trials on human subjects, which they viewed as producing meaningful results. Yet my second argument is that learned doctors did not create these poison trials in a scholarly vacuum. They were well aware of a different kind of poison trial that was already gaining steam. Vibrant marketplace shows by mountebanks and charlatans who sold antidotes and cure-alls through dramatic displays of self-poisoning or poison demonstrations on animals in the marketplace. So this was a time period with a huge variety of medical practitioners. Um, physicians are certainly not always top on everyone's list of who to go to for a cure. So this was a time when physicians were really trying to separate themselves from other kinds of practitioners. Um, and yet they were also very interested in doing these poison tests. So I argue that physicians use th these poison trials um, to deliver, deliberately portray them as learned experiments in order to contrast them to Charlatan's Marketplace poison shows. So that's part of the reason why they make such careful notes and is, are writing everything down. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, in the second part of my talk. At the same time, they could never escape the marketplace. They were always watching what empirical practitioners had to offer. So Paolo Giovio, Pope Clement's physician, tested drugs hawked by the lower class empiric caravita. Mattioli created and sold his own alchemical poison antidote, which he called scorpion oil, which I saw a question in the chat about what was in caravita's oil. And Mattioli claimed that his scorpion oil um, was in fact a, a version of caravita's oil. And it involved um, basically boiling a bunch of scorpions in hot oil and then adding a bunch of other ingredients and then distilling it. So it was all an alchemical um, remedy that involved live scorpions. Um, this is just a stock image, obviously. Um, Many others also eagerly sought and sometimes even advertise new wonder drugs with claims of success that to our ears sound very far-fetched. So my book aims to blur the lines that physicians tried and failed to draw around their practice. So finally, I argue the experimenters were forced to take into account the limitations of using humans for deadly tests a kind of early medical ethics centered on cultural and religious norms. Previous historical scholarship has given little attention to humans as experimental subjects before the 18th century. So the 18th century is always seen as sort of a turning point. But there's been a lot of literature on the use of cadavers for anatomical investigation in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And it's well known that this convention faced a lot of resistance from local populaces. Using living, living criminals to test poison was even more complicated than using dead ones for dissection, I argue. And testers used a variety of devices to make the practice acceptable. This was far from modern medical ethics. There was little concern with the gruesome effects of the tests. 
Nevertheless, the testers devoted surprising attention to the narrative surrounding human experimentation. And I'll delve a little bit uh, more into this point in the second half of my talk as well. So you might be wondering what all the fuss about poison was in the first place. Um, so the reason why poison was so important or is really twofold. First, our obvious, the more obvious one maybe to you, the concern about malicious poisoning was always a problem um, throughout, you know, throughout history, I guess I could say, of most um, periods of history, but uh, particularly in the Renaissance. And cures um, for poison were just important for princes to feel like they could sort of defend themselves against their enemies. Um, but a second reason, which I think was just as important, was that um, poison was viewed as an underlining cause of epidemic diseases and especially plague. So I mentioned that um, the way that poison operated helped explain why people could be affected by poison who had all sorts of different humoral complexions. Well, the same was true of plague. So poison um, plague also affected people of a variety of complexions. So poison was used as an explanation for plague and then expanded to include also other epidemic diseases that affected a large number of pe people in similar ways. So um, a cure for poison could therefore be a cure for plague and other diseases, which to any Renaissance prince would have been just as valuable as protection to himself because he could um, help protect his people. And um, note that Caravita first came to Pope Clement's attention because he claimed to have successfully cured many plague patients. There was a long tradition of poison antidotes as cures for diseases more broadly. Um, and the ancient antidote Seriac was a prime example. But and as um, time went on, there was a, a additional ones really became more and more popular. So unicorn horn and bezoar stone were animal products viewed as good against poison, but also other diseases. And I know Chris Stefan has written about both of these. Um, and as the Portuguese expanded into South Asia, bezoar and other items sold as unicorn horn, so usually rhinoceros horn or narwhal tusk, um, became more affordable. They were still very expensive, but they were much more accessible than they had been previously. And with the Spanish colonization of the Americas, hundreds of potentially useful drugs poured into Europe and led to an unprecedented collaboration between physicians and merchants. Some of these drugs were remedies for specific diseases or specific purposes, but others were touted as near panaceas that could, among other things, cure poison. Um, the most famous example is tobacco, which was described as a panacea herb in a Dutch publication from 1587 and counted anti-poison properties among its many virtues. Um, so there was a close tie between both um, poison antidotes that could more broadly be seen as wonder drugs and wonder drugs that had poison um, fighting properties as part of, of their wondrous properties. Um, new cure-alls also emerged from a separate tradition, the practice of alchemical medicine and distillation. So a flourishing interest in distillation in the 16th century led to a boom in new alchemical cures. Many of these drugs were viewed as near cure-alls and like poison antidotes, they were assumed to work universally on, our, on all bodies. So in some, there were a lot of new drugs, which also helped the impetus towards testing because there was a lot of new drugs to sort through. And there was a real drive to figure out what worked or to if, if you were marketing the drugs to advertise that your drug worked. So Renaissance individuals, from what I found, were almost never testing the ancient antidote seriac, which had been the focus of most testing to that point. They were testing all of these other newer remedies. So my book traces poison trials and their wider meaning over the long durée from ancient Greece into the 17th century with a main focus on events in the 16th century. Um, so I take a pan-European approach. Uh, I draw in examples from around Europe and its colonies, but the bulk of evidence comes from Renaissance Italy and the Holy Roman Empire. The way I've organized it is that each chapter I pick an antidote to have as its center. So I begin with a discussion of Caravita's oil that I've introduced to you as well. I broke the book into three sections. Um, the first part on authorities, the second part on experiments, the third part called wonder drugs. Um, the first section focuses on precedents for poison trials. So the um, 
background and some of the background that I've laid out for you a little here in, in Greek and, and Roman sources in the Middle Ages um, and the real focus on poison as a particularly testable subject, uh, substance. Um, the second chapter involves, looks at the trial of Caravitas oil more closely and the background of anatomical dissection as context for the development of poison trials and also the way that Caravitas oil trial engendered additional trials in Italy under Catholic authorities. Chapter three, which I will discuss in more detail presently, looks at Mattioli's role in spreading poison trials around Europe um, and examines poison trials as learned experiments. Chapter four examines that case I found in the archive of Neuenstein as a lens on a sort of early medical ethics. Um, I'll hear more about that in a minute. Chapter five examines poison antidotes as valuable commodities that were part of the drug trade and the way that that um, impacted different methods of testing. And chapter six looks at one enterprising alchemist who confounded physicians with a poison antidote that he specifically called a panacea. Um, and he specifically highlighted patient testimonial letters as better proof of efficacy than poison trials. So the whole book basically asks questions about what counted as proof of a cure and how physicians negotiated their own authority around that question. Okay, so now I'd like to delve into the um, couple of the chapters of my book. I'm going to focus on the middle section on experiments. Um, so I will talk a little, little bit about chapter three, which um, talks about um, drugs, uh, the, the, these poison trials as medical experiments. And then I will give some bit of chapter four, which focuses on the question of medical ethics. So chapter three begins with a failure. Um, it describes how in 1561, a group of physicians gathered in Prague Castle to observe a soldier condemned to be hanged for thievery, take a dose of poison followed by an antidote. The test had been ordered and the cr criminal granted by the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I. And it aimed to see whether a special powder against poison created by the emperor's son, Archduke Ferdinand II of Tyrol, could overcome the deadly aconite Napellus. Um, so you once again here see Napellus appearing as a particularly feared kind of poison. The famous physician Pietro Andrea Mattioli read the, led the proceedings. As the doctors looked on, the prisoner ate a dram, which is about four grams of powdered Napellus root mixed with rose sugar. And then nothing happened. After an hour and a half sitting in a warm room, probably making very awkward small talk, the prisoner still felt completely fine. The physician speculated that the problem lay in the Bohemian Napellus they used, which they thought was perhaps less potent owing to the colder climate than the Mediterranean Napellus described by the ancient authorities they were reading. So they decided to give him a second dose and they waited another two hours and the prisoner still felt fine. So the physician sent him back to his prison cell and went home. An hour later, a prison guard alerted Mattioli that the prisoner had started to feel poorly. Mattioli rushed back. Although the prisoner still claimed he felt fine, Mattioli could tell from the cold sweat on the man's brow and his fading pulse that the poison was working. So here he's um, describing how he used his physician's expertise to um, come to this diagnosis. He gave the prisoner a dose of the antidote mixed with wine. Immediately, his eyes rolled back in his head. He thrashed about and grabbed his throat and he would have fallen if the prison guard had not grabbed him. Mattioli surmised that the poison and the antidote were fighting and the prisoners proceeded to suffer some very unpleasant effects, mostly evacuations from both ends. I'll spare you the details. Um, and eventually said he felt a little bit better, but then lay down on the straw in his cell and died. So we know about this event in such detail because Mattioli himself wrote it down. He added it to the 1563 edition of his book and all later editions after that. One of the many interesting twists to this case is that Mattioli was a personal physician to Archduke Ferdinand, 
whose powder was being tested. He thus committed to writing and to print an abject failure of his own patron's poison antidote. Um, so the question I asked going into this chapter is why would he do this? Um, why would he sort of explain in such excruciating detail that his patron's antidote had failed to overcome the poison? So I argue that the outcome was less important to Mattioli than the process. Mattioli described the effects of the poison and the antidote in ways that conformed with accepted medical theory. It first affected the heart, then moved to the stomach and the intestines. And the failure to merely concern, merely confirmed existing scholarly opinion. According to Mattioli, the inability of the archducal poison powder, powder to prevent the prisoner's death had nothing to do with the powder itself, which he said might have just been an old batch. It wasn't the powder's fault. Instead, it reinforced the toxicity of the poison, which he said proved the correctness of ideas about aconite written by Avicenna, um, one of the most um, iconic Arabic physicians who Mattioli in general follows very closely. So poison trial in this telling were a scholarly enterprise conducted in the footsteps of learned medical tradition. So all very um, uh, scholarly and above board. So there is a foil for this depiction and I'm coming back to the theme of charlatans that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. In a different part of his commentary, Machiavelli contrasted learned physicians poison trials with another less legitimate kind of testing. He warned his readers to guard themselves against counterfeit theriac sold in the piazza by snake charmers. These dishonest deceivers used all sorts of deceptive tricks to appear to test their pseudo theriac in public and hoodwink many vulgar ignorance, as he said. Directly after this criticism, however, Mattioli advertised his own oil of scorpions, which I've already mentioned. Um, so he, there's this like real cognitive dissonance from this complete diatribe against empirics doing poison tests in the marketplace to describing his own scorpion oil, which he mentioned had been tested um, in this trial of Caravita's oil. And he said, go back and read this, you know, the, this trial in this section of my book if you want to know how it happened. Um, so this points to a major problem for Mattioli and other physicians how to distinguish physicians' poison trials from the tests conducted by lower class empirical practitioners, known varyingly as snake charmers, mountebanks, theriac peddlers, empiric charlatans, and other derogatory names. It was standard practice for physicians to criticize these healers, but it was something else entirely for them to conduct tests that to the neutral observer might appear vaguely similar. So to set themselves apart from these lower class empirics, physicians developed a model for a learned poison trial. This model involved both methods of testing and strategies of communication that presented a direct contrast to Mountebike Bank's marketplace shows. Um, in doing so, they explicitly cast experiment as a scholarly endeavor. So some of these um, things included, they always included signs that the poison had taken effect. So they described the symptoms and that, that the poison was causing. The symptoms that the poison suffered, um, which ran the gamut, pains, nausea, vomiting, usually a cold feeling, physicians um, often poison was seen as bringing cold with it. Um, the time of day that this happened. So uh, specific time markers, um, often very direct ones as we'll see in a minute. Um, and then the state of the prisoner, um, if, if you know, if they were after the recovery, if relevant. So did the recovery last? Um, they also frequently use things like pulse, like well, what did the prisoner's pulse um, feel like? What did the prisoner look like? So they're using um, all of these things that were very much part of learned medical practice um, and writing them out in great detail. Mattioli was not the only person to document poison trials. Emperor Ferdinand's surgeon, um, a man named Claudius Ricardus, also described two other poison trials at Ferdinand's court right around around the same time, um, both of which aimed to test Bezoar stone, which some of you may remember from Harry Potter. One, um, but is a sort of calcified um, 
byproduct of digestion found in the stomach of some animals. The most um, prized bezoar stone came from Persian mountain goats at the time period. So Emperor Ferdinand, before there was a big sort of bezoar boom towards the end of the 16th century, but even before that, Emperor Ferdinand had acquired some and he wanted to test it. Um, so this test that was conducted by um, Claudius Ricardus took place just after Mattioli's failure. And you can see a direct relationship between the two tests. So like Mattioli's test, it used Napellus as a poison. It just used a different antidote. The exact same dose of Napellus was given as in the failed trial, the initial dose in the failed trial. This time, however, food was withheld from the prisoner um, and it was specifically said so that his body would be more open to the poison. And this point was mentioned repeatedly throughout um, Ricardus's account of the trial. The, in this case, the poison worked right away and the prisoner lived. Um, Ricardus also described a second case um, in which it was a sort of a very similar um, you know, description, except that not only was food withheld, but the prisoner was also not allowed to sleep the night before. So they're clearly um, manipulating in quite horrific ways, obviously, the prisoner's bodies ahead of time to try to make the poison more effective and, and thus the experiment um, work better. There's also a particularly interesting case um, in a physician's rec records in the Strozzi archives in Florence, um, which tested Cosimo de Medici's poison powder, um, so a different poison powder. Um, you can see that he was, uh, was testing a man who was condemned to death, who was in the Bargello prison waiting to be executed. He was given two drams of arsenic in order to test um, Cosimo's poison powder. So this one is particularly interesting because of how carefully um, they mentioned time markers. Um, so the prisoner took the arsenic at 12 hours, three quarters of an hour afterwards, he began to feel bloating in his body with a slight pain. The physicians took his pulse, found it very rapid, um, thought the poison had not quite taken effect. Um, 14 and a third hours, he complained of a bitter throat and the doctors found his pulse weaker. Half an hour later, he complained of an internal coldness in his stomach, and the doctors found his pulse again much weaker and decided to prepare the antidote. So I won't give you the gory details of what happened then, but the physicians recorded every instance, always with careful time markers and checks for the pulse. Um, and this back and forth went on for several days. They had to give the antidote multiple times. They never actually recorded what happened in the end. So whether the prisoner lived or died, they sort of leave vague. Um, and really the report is more about how poison affects the body and the antidote following it than it is about whether this antidote was successful or not. So so part of my argument in this chapter that from the physician's point of view, the question of um, what happens when poisons and antidotes are given to a human body is actually more important than does the prison prisoner live or die. They're interested in sort of the intellectual question of it more than whether this antidote works or not. A final case. Um, that I discuss in this chapter, which is a nice segue to the next chapter, took place not on humans, thankfully, but on dogs um, at the court of Landgrave Wilhelm IV of Hesse Kassel. Um, and in this case, it was quite extensive. So the physicians took eight dogs and four poisons. Um, they tested the dogs in pairs. And for each pair, both dogs got the same amount of poison, but only one got the antidote. And then it turned out that all dogs who received the antidote survived and those who did not died. Um, so this all seems like it's you know, very well thought out. It's important to note, however, that the antidote in this case came from an empirical practitioner, a man named Andreas Berthold, who came to Wilhelm to offer his antidote for sale. So again, it's a commercial um, empirical practice that's sort of driving this test in this case. Um, so these, and this, we know about it partially from a printed report that Berthold had included in his book and Berthold specifically asked for this testimonial letter to include as kind of a, a um, marker to help him sell his drug. So while these detailed reports were meant to separate physicians from empirics, it was always hard for physicians to draw clean lines. 
But this case of the um, dog trials also shows that reports of these poison trials were read with interest because not only do we have this printed account um, that Bertold published, but there's also handwritten accounts um, in a few archives in Germany. This particular one was um, in, somehow found its way into the hands of Countess Palatine Elizabeth of Saxony um, and is included among her papers. Um, and somehow possibly via Elizabeth, it also found its way into the hands of Countess Anna of Hohenlohe, who was a close friend of Elizabeth's. So Anna brought, bought some of Bertold's Terra Sigillata on the report, the strength of this report on the dog trials. Um, and as we will see, this engendered the poison trial that um, forms the center of my fourth chapter, which is um, exploring the implications of using human test subjects a little more deeply. So from our modern perspective, poison trials on humans were obviously horrific. Um, and it would be easy for us to assume from these accounts that in the 16th century, you could just do whatever horrible things you wanted to human beings without a problem. Um, poison trials appear to show this, and to some extent that was true, but it was also much more complicated than that. So my fourth chapter focuses on a pattern I began to notice when I was reading through all of these really horrific trial accounts, which was really surprising to me. Um, so in most poison trials, condemned criminals were pre presented as giving their consent to the poison trial. So it's mentioned that he, the, the test subject agreed to take the poison. This was not true in the initial test of caravita's oil that I mentioned, but basically all the other ones I found, the prisoner's consent is mentioned. Second, these trials are presented as taking place for the public good, or it's often presented as for the good of all Christendom. Um, and finally, prisoners were almost always set free if they survived, or in certain instances in which prisoners were, were particularly violent prisoners, they were often given a mitigated sentence if they survived. Um, so all three of these I found really interesting because I was surprised that there was sort of any thought about this at all. And it's also particularly interesting because the first two items of the Nuremberg Code after created after World War II listed both the idea of consent and um, the public good as two principles for testing drugs. So, um, I mean, there is obviously a lot of historical distance between these two, but that these issues were even coming up as things that were mentioned in the 16th century was really surprising to me. My 16th century poison trials took place a long time before any formal medical ethics. So the term medical ethics did not even exist at the time. And I think we can all agree that today they would be considered extremely unethical. So I was asking why the focus on consent and public good and why the reward of setting surviving prisoners free. So luckily, I to answer this question, I had a really good um, case to help me. So the original case I found back in that Hohenlohe archive um, brought these two issues into focus really explicitly. Um, so this trial was a very fascinating case. It described um, how in December of 1580, a man named Wendel Tumler stole a coin from another patron in a tavern in a village near the castle city of Langenborg. He was caught red-handed, marched down the river, and thrown into the dungeon in Langenborg Castle. He was questioned the next day and initially confessed to just a couple of minor misdeeds, but eventually he was tortured and under torture, he confessed to 74 counts of thievery, most of them horse thefts, which was a significant crime at the time. Um, you can see how in the margins, the notaries actually tried to verify many of his confessions. Um, they didn't just believe him out of hands, but, and some of them, they actually noted that, that they couldn't have happened because the person did, wasn't missing anything. Um, but there are enough ones that, that they verified that it was enough to condemn him to death by hanging. But there is much more to this convi conviction that met the eye. From the beginning of this case, the local prince, Wolfgang II of Hohenlohe, had his eye on Tumler as a subject to test the Silesian Terra Sigillata um, that Andreas Berthold was selling. And there's a whole side story about Count Wolfgang really driving the use of torture in this case. 
So this poison antidote was the same one I just mentioned at the end of this last chapter, which Wolf, Wolfgang's mother had purchased, as we had heard. So his mother was the one who had gotten this quantity of drug. And he explicitly mentions this in the documentation that our dear mother has obtained this and, and that she they both wish to see if the antidote worked as well on humans as on animals. So the issue of human animal transfer came into explicit focus here. So it seemed likely that Wolfgang was on the lookout for a potential human test subject and Wendel Tumler entered this at a particular time. But his counselors were concerned about um, using, first of all, about the whole issue of torturing Tumler to start with, and then about how to best use him for this test of the poison antidote. And particularly concerned was his trusted advisor, whose name was Zacharias Husso. Husso worried that there would be unrest among the peasantry if Tumler was either seen to be coerced into the test or if Tumler took the antidote, survived, and then the peasants had to accept a hardened criminal back into their midst. So Husso specifically frames this as a concern about unrest among the peasantry, whom he called foolhardy, so they don't come off well in his estimation. Um, and he's worried about how this, can, this will look. Husso lived in Neuenstein rather than Langenberg, so his letters back and forth with Wolfgang are preserved. Um, and this back and forth gave me some actual perspective on what might have been going on behind the scenes in poison trials. It demonstrated that the use of human bodies for poison testing was not as straightforward as it seemed. Um, and I saw lots of echoes of this in other sources, but this source laid it out explicitly. So Husso and Wolfgang's other advisors um, agreed that Wolfgang could proceed with a poison trial, but that it had to be done with great care. And they wrote a really careful document that explained exactly how things should proceed. And it's written like a play, giving everyone their part. So they said that a third party should code a Tumler and tell him that Count Wolfgang had an antidote to poison that he wanted to test. And that person should suggest that Tumler go to the legal authorities and offer himself as a test subject. And he should make it clear that he was doing it, and this is a direct quote, out of his own free will, without any tricks or force, also without being convinced or told to do it. Um, so here it really spells out in great detail that he had to feel like he's doing this on his own free will. And Kalf, once he did this, Count Wolfgang should at first appear reluctant, um, given his terrible crimes. He was, should be reluctant to let him off um, from his execution. But he should then relent and agree to do it um, because the medicine would come to the benefit of so many God-fearing people. And this point is reiterated like three times, the good, pious, God-fearing people it would save. So this makes very explicit that these two points are really important, but why, why are they important? So really quickly, I have two answers to that question. Um, first is that um, doing a poison trial was an interruption to the very important ritual of execution at the time. So execution was an important, both religious and cultural ritual, as well as being an instrument of justice. It was supposed to deter other criminals while also guiding the condemned to a good death. Um, and Catholic thought the condemned could get time off purgatory or even skip purgatory entirely if he was penitent and in the right way with God at the moment of execution. For Protestants, a criminal could go to heaven if he believed in Jesus in his final moments. Um, so from the point of view of the public, it also published punished a dangerous criminal and kept him out of society. So to interrupt these things was a really big deal and it needed good justification. And then secondly, um, poison was viewed as a sneaky, scurrilous crime and it was something princes did not want to be associated with. In fact, throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, princes often accused each other of being poisoners as an insult. Um, so it, it was seen as something that's really not a good thing. Um, so there is this famous Lauren Sati fresco um, in Siena that personifies bad government as a devil tyrant holding a cup of poison. Um, so poison's really associated with tyranny and also with sneakiness and not something princes want to be attached to them. <clears throat> 
So in the end, the answer to these potential problems was showing that there was a proper procedure in place. Um, so this is very German bureaucratic that it's spelled out so explicitly, but this is also appears in a bunch of the other poison trials I saw. So Tumler had to be shown to consent without any coercion, the public good was emphasized, and he was promised freedom, although he, in this case, he was banished um, rather than executed. And incidentally, we do have a separate um, account of this um, from our old friend Andreas Berthold. He published an account of this poison trial as well, which basically just follows, the, the report follows the script that um, Wolfgang's counselors let out. So it's basically written as if, you know, the, the script had been followed. Um, Tumler did survive. He was banned from coming within 10 miles of Langenburg. His parents just took him home. So this obviously um, helped the concerns about the, the criminal going back into the, the society. In any case, this is obviously not the kind of medical ethics based on human dignity and justice like we have today, but it was an attempt to negotiate the problem of using human bodies for medical research. And I found it very interesting that th there was even this kind of negotiation. So that, I think with that, I'm at about an hour. So I think I will stop talking and say thank you. And I, any, I know I, there's a lot more I could talk about, but I look forward to addressing any questions um, in the Q&A. So thanks very much for letting me share this with you. And I'm gonna stop my screen share so that I can see people's faces. Okay. Uh, Alicia, many thanks for, uh, for that uh, talk. and. Uh, expertly guiding us through these uh, poison trials and their history. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, can I just start the ball rolling by saying that uh, Berthold was um, very, very efficient at advertising the Terra uh, Strigensis, because when you look at um, uh, 18th century, particularly um, med materia medica cabinets, it's the most highly represented uh, cake of Terra Sigillata you'll find apart from Terra Lemnia. Uh, I just wondered if you, um, had been to Striga, and uh, if there was any remains of the workings for this, because there must have been a huge amount actually produced, and is there any sign of it uh, historically uh, in the area today? I was not able to, to travel to um, Striga, for, for which is now Stresigum in Poland, for this. Um, I really wanted to, but it just didn't work out with, with everything coming from the States. Um, but I, but I do know from doing research that the mine that produced the Terra Sigillata collapsed in the 19th, early 19th century. So at some point, I mean, this was a huge part of the economy of this town. You're right. If you go to any pharmacy museum, it's full of these little, you know, medallions of Terra Sigillata. And um, I, as part of the research for this, I went to the Basel Pharmacy Museum, um, which has a, a huge amount of it. And they were so excited that I was excited about it because <laughs> mostly people are like, what are these little pieces of like, dirt um, but I was like really really excited to see them um, but uh, yeah so so this was a huge part of the city's economy and then the mines collapsed and the whole industry collapsed after that um, so I think that there is not a lot um, the most I could find is there's a plaque to so the um, I mean Bertold marketed this in western Europe but it was said to have been discovered by a Paracelsian physician named Johannes Montanus, um, who lived in, in Spiga. Um, and there's a plaque to him in, apparently in, in the town center. But I wrote to um, the Bresnik archives, which would have been responsible for Striga, and they said they lost most of the materials in the war that would have been um, covered this. So I had like, yeah, that was a, a part of this I was really interested in that I didn't get to follow up as much as I would have liked to. Okay, thank you. Um, now, we've got several questions in the chat bar. Um, uh, George Gomez asks, um, um, when about in history did uh, clinical trials begin, presumably replacing the sorts of poison trials that you've been talking about? Yeah, so that's much later. So, you know, 20th century. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is really, you know, very early inklings. And I'm not making any sort of claim that these resemble modern RCTs because that's a because that's a completely different thing. But it's just sort of like the early sense that this that that doing some kind of actual testing is um, is worthwhile and important. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Jeanette uh, asked, did anyone have the opportunity to test the antidote, antidote oils directly against plague? 
um, as it could also be claimed to cure that. And did charlatans well, use similar cures? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so they, in, in many cases, these were, these antidotes were actually used against plague. So I mentioned, I mean, so we, we know that carbitis oil was first used against plague or, you know, and then, and I should say when I say used, you know, from the modern perspective, it's likely that none of these would have cured poison or, um, or plague, certainly. Um, but I'm sort of using actors categories and say, you know, when, and when it's report is viewed at the time to have been effective against plague. Um, and then um, Landgrave Wilhelm IV of hesse Kassel, who did the series of extensive experiments on dogs, he actually did that in the middle of a plague ec epidemic. And there's um, reports of his attempts to kind of send Ter Terracigalata to various villages in his regions to use for plague. Um, and there was a big crunch trying to buy the Terracigalata because so many princes were interested in trying to buy it up because there was this um, plague epidemic at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Gemma asked, what herbs were boiled in the oil? I presume Caraventa's oil. Uh, is it, and is it uh, detailed in your book? Um, no, so that so uh, Matili gives this recipe. I'm trying to remember what the herbs are. It's not. It's mostly not herbs. It's things like theriac and terracigalata, and it's a lot of other poison antidotes that are boiled, like existing ones that are boiled along with the scorpions. Um, and I think there are a couple of herbs, but I don't remember which ones. Okay. Um, and uh, Jeanette uh, uh, says presumably those prisoners that consented to take part in the trials had actually been condemned to death. Otherwise yes. it wouldn't have uh, been worth them taking part. Oh yes, 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 yes. That's sorry, that's a that's a thing I should have um made made clear. Yes, these are only people prisoners who are already condemned to death. So they're going to be executed anyway. And it's just a method of potential execution. So that's that's why setting them free is quite a big deal because um you know, they'll be let off the sentence of execution, which was extremely rare. So it was very, very, very unusual to let someone off the execution sentence. Yeah. And Bryony says it's interesting to reflect on the ongoing centrality of prisoners to the trials of new and or risky substances with later resonance, of course, for other trials like that for smallpox vaccines in the early 18th century. Yes, that's. I'm actually working on an um, article right now on the sort of long history of using criminals as test subjects into the 18th century. And I would like to make this into a book, actually, into the 20th century, because it's an interesting group for a test subject. I mean, there are lots of large, vulnerable groups used for as test subjects, um, orphans, military populations, um, hospital patients at the time who were tended to be very poor. Um, but prisoners are interesting because they are viewed as owing a debt back to society. So there is an interesting moral aspect of the use of prisoners. Um, and because a lot of them are condemned criminals, there is like less concern about what they're actually doing to their bodies. Uh, there's a couple of comments in the chat section about the origins of Bazaar, but the answers are already in there in responses. So I'll, I'll move on to Tony Cartwright's comment that there's a rationale for the use of clays such as terracigelata, which will uh, absorb toxic materials, uh, kaolin and atapulgite uh, are commonly used in treating diarrhea. And I can also add there that there have been uh, trials that show that these things have um, um, antibacterial properties as well. Yeah, yeah, the terracigalata is the one that the most, I think the most modern research has been done of any of these substances and um, seems to show some effects, and, and which is interesting from my perspective because that's the one that was the most effective, like uh, of the ones that, that seemed to work, that one definitely seemed the most effective. Yeah. And uh, uh, Maggie says, how do the scorpions work uh, in these antidotes? What's the idea behind that? including their scorpions. Oh, so the, the, so the, the intellectual idea is that they're a poison, they're, they're considered a poisonous animal. So it's sort of like defanging the poison to use it as part of the antidote, which you find a lot in ant poison antidotes. So theriac, for example, used um, the flesh of venomous snakes. Um, so there was sort of the, the connection between venom and anti-venom is very close there. Yeah, so it's a principle of sympathy, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Peter says, did any of these antidotes actually work? And if not, what means, uh, if not, wait, did, did, did any of them actually work? Well, so I think I think you've handily helped answer that question, Chris, by mentioning the terracigalata. So terracigalata is the one that that may um, 
work. I, th I think there's been very little research done on any others. There is no indication why any of the other ones would work. From I mean, the, the Caravitas oil was an external application. It had very strong religious resonances. So it was anointed in the same way that holy oil might be anointed. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine how that would have worked from modern perspective. But again, this is like, it's about the power it's giving to the princes more than about what it actually did um, that, that I was interested in looking in, in this book. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria makes the comment that uh, there were some medical ethics from Hippocrates onwards where physicians shouldn't give deadly medicines to their patients. Uh, they shouldn't yeah. give abortive fascines, for example. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, which is which is interesting in this case because physicians are giving poison to their patients. So I find that's which you know the Hippocratic oath was well known. It was not sworn in the 16th century the way it is in modern medical schools at least in the United States, but um but yeah, no that that that's absolutely correct. Yeah. And Greg Hig Higby notes that uh, asked rather did any of the prisoners who died from the poisons actually wind up in the hands of the anatomists? That's a great question. Um so Interestingly, the ones that I have looked at don't seem to have been intended for um, for um, being dissected afterwards because uh, a lot of them took place in the summer, which was not the time for anatomical dissections. When they did dissections, it tended to be in the winter so that the bodies would stay, um, you know, okay for longer. Um, and uh, and that's very interesting. And there is one case um, in which Cosimo de Medici gave the anatomist Gabriella Fallopio, known for naming the fallopian tubes, um, a prisoner to do what he wanted with. And Fallopio experimented with different quantities of opium and eventually gave him a fatal dose and died and he dissected it. So he was basically given this prisoner to dissect and the Cosimo basically said, kill him however you want. Um, and and this was, but but that was not a testing an antidote. That was like, the, the aim for that was dissection. I didn't find any cases, um, at least in the more detailed trials in which the um, prisoner was dissected. There are a couple of ones early on in which they dissected the prisoner to see after he died, the ones that where they died, they dissected them to see what the insides looked like, um, what the effects of the poison mm -hmm. were. So there, there were um, at least one of not two cases in which that did happen. Okay, thanks. And Ed Vavrinsak uh, uh, says, as well as detailed reports, did the procedures involved give importance to having witnesses present at the trials? Um, so the, I mean, the, I think that the, um, I'm trying to think of that question actually. I don't, I don't remember seeing any emphasis on having witnesses per se, except that it's true that several people would sign them. So it's, it's possible that yes, having, you know, multiple signatures there was important. So the signatures of whoever was there, which was usually the physician, one or two physicians, and almost always an apothecary as well, um, would would sign their names. But that could either be just a marker of authority, or it could be witnessing. So, like putting their medical authority behind it is more how I read it. But it could also, you know, having multiple witnesses could be important. But it certainly wasn't something. The number of witnesses was not something that was emphasized in the accounts. Okay, I, I seem to remember that Olive Worm actually had uh, four witnesses for testing unicorn horn at uh, his local oh, shop. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and he he calls them witnesses, as far as I remember. So, he calls them witnesses. Okay, yeah, yeah. He, his was a little bit later than I was looking. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, we got there's 17 new messages come up. There's no, there's no <laughs> way we're going to be able to get through all this. Uh, I'll, I'll ask a couple more questions, but can I direct people perhaps to your um, uh, to your your web page at the university if they want to follow up on some of this. Oh, please, uh, please Alicia. do, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you. So um, you've emphasized princely courts, says Stephen Johnson, um, as a particularly prominent venue for the poison trials while under uh, while underlying that the physicians differentiated themselves from empirics by their learned practice. Is there an echo in contemporary university circles uh, <laughs> or is the courtly context separate? <laughs> I, I, th I think the courtly, I hope the courtly context is quite different from today. I'd like to think so. <laughs> yeah. Is there a sense, says Charlotte, uh, that imported ingredients were better for poison than native ones? 
this, yeah, there's an exotic element of it that yes, absolutely. That's, that's a really strong association throughout the book that some of these exotic, um, either exotic imported ones from coming from afar or, or ones created by alchemists that also had a certain amount of exoticism to them um, were the most common ones that were tested. Well, I'll, I'll perhaps finish with this last question uh, because this will lead nicely on to your next book um, and just remind people to get in touch with Alicia. Um, if you go to the Tufts University website, you'll be able to find her email address there. Uh, but Maggie says, please tell us how your research for this ties in with the witchcraft theme of your new book. Yes. Um, well, so part of this, so this also ties into, I see Gemma's question about whether they only tested men, which the answer to that is yes, because the condemned criminals were almost all men, um, that especially the ones for, for theft, which is the thing they were um, most commonly condemned of. But I was um, realizing in this that it was, it was really interesting that there's this very male-centered world of looking at poison antidotes when poison was very strongly attached to women at the time and women in witchcraft. Um, so I was so I, I was asked to write an article about gender and poison antidotes um, and came uh, and realized that there is a much stronger association with women as poisoners and men with healing poison. So a lot of these antidotes tied to princes are tied to princes. A lot of the antidotes that are tied to a person is tied to sort of a powerful man. Um, so that kind of got me interested into in the question of poison and witchcraft, which has turned into this really fascinating poison. That's sort of my entry into this is the very close connection between poison and witchcraft, um, which is sort of um, something that is reiterated time and again. So I'm really at the beginning parts of this, um, but poison and witchcraft are really linked both legally as crimes, but also metaphorically, this is something that's a very close tie. Okay, that's brilliant. Well, we look forward to the next book and perhaps the next lecture to follow up on that, if we can invite you again. Thank you so much, Alicia, for your time. Thank you and very for, much. Uh, your thank expertise. You for, yeah, thank you for such interesting questions. This was really fun. So can I just remind everybody that details concerning our program of lectures are available on the website and can be booked through links on Eventbrite. Our next talk will consider the uses of emeralds in the history of medicine and will take place on Monday the 21st of February. If you've attended of any of our online lectures before, you should automatically receive notification of upcoming ones uh, via Eventbrite, as we said. But alternatively, keep an eye on the website where we regularly update details of our planned talks with appropriate links for advanced booking and so on. Now, I'm sorry about the, um, we had a bit of a glitch with the recording on YouTube, so that's why we suddenly started recording on Zoom partway through, so I apologise for the interruption to Alicia and um, uh, also to listeners, um, but uh, we will make it available, and we got most of it, I think, it's just perhaps the three or four minutes at the beginning that we're missing. So thank you all very much for uh, for coming and uh, for all your expressions of uh, thanks to Alicia. Uh, lots and lots there, which I'm sure you'll be able to read. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you.